Okay, let's start. It's 3 p.m. So it, um, it's just the right time. So let me um, welcome everyone. Okay, um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to everyone, to our esteemed and distinguished speakers, and to all those people who are part of this webinar, and also those people watching and participating by a live stream in different on different social media platforms, uh, especially with, um, especially on the social media platform of the official media partner of this webinar, the Manila Times. Um, good afternoon, and thank you for attending and participating for um, in this very um, timely and very important, I think, webinar on oil and gas joint development cooperation between China and the Philippines. To give us an opening remarks, may I call on. Captain Andy Shi Chen, um, founder and president of Global Governance Institution. Um, Captain Andy, you have the floor. Thank you, Anna. Uh, good afternoon. On behalf of the Global Governance Institution, a warm welcome to both old and new friends and uh, media platform friends, in particular, our co organizers from the Philippines, the Asian Century Philippines Strategic Studies and the Integrity Development Studies Institute for their valuable contribution and support. I'm retired Captain Andy Chen, founder and the president of the Global Government Institution. As an independent non-government international think tank, we have always been devoted to encouraging open, frank, and uh, thought-provoking discussion and debates on significant, significant issues that concern both China and the global stakeholders. Uh, sino philippines relationship is surely one of the most significant issues as such in neighboring relations. Uh, is, since neighboring relations is always vital among China's foreign relations, as one of the series of China-Philippines dialogue at the NGO level, today we are going to focus on oil and gas joint development cooperation. Uh, since taking office, uh, His Excellency Mr. Duterte, the former president of the Philippines, has decided to leave aside the South China Sea arbitration on hold to improve relations with China. On the ground of that, Manila and Beijing signed a memorandum of understanding, uh, on, understanding mm -hmm. on oil and gas development cooperation in 2018 and held the first meeting of the Philippine-China Joint Steering Committee on Oil and Gas Development Cooperation in 2019, uh, agreeing to further promoting uh, communication and coordination on oil and gas development for mutual benefits of both countries and their peoples. And then on two, June 23, uh, 2022, the outgoing uh, uh, Philippine Foreign Affairs Secretary uh, 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 gave a statement about the oil and gas discussion uh, between China and Philippines. And such statement uh, has triggered concern from, uh, uh, from both sides. Uh, first of all, the bilateral cooperation on joint development of oil and gas and related discussions, uh, negotiations, is a consensus uh, reached between the two sides from presidents and the high level ministers of the two countries to working groups at operational levels across a whole range of fields and disciplines. Both countries have carried out a lot of de detailed work and made uh, concrete efforts to ensure a legal and transparent bilateral cooperation that would benefit both sides. Uh, there was consensus and accomplishments credited by the two sides. Given the above tremendous efforts done by both sides at all level, how will the current government take this? The key question is, will the tremendous efforts and accomplishments of both governments be offset or wiped out by uh, individual statements? Given my own long-term experience as a military diplomat, I think we need to adopt an objective understanding of the role of the diplomatic talks in managing maritime disputes. 
A number of international practice reveal that since sensitive diplomatic negotiations would involve a political, uh, uh, diplomatic, security, and other complex factors, it is expected to go through a long and a tedious process with prolonged delays and uncertainties before a remarkable consensus could be reached, could be achieved. As the very last tense, it is worth clarifying that the current situation, in particular, the successful efforts from both sides to maintain effective communication is in itself meaningful outcomes. So how to take this issue forward? For my own understanding, certain suggestive points for us to keep in mind. First, both sides should respect the consensus already reached. Second, resolving the differences between China and the Philippines and also between China and other countries through diplomacy and dialogue, maximizing bilateral consolidative mechanisms and multilateral mechanisms through the, through the ASEAN level without affecting the two countries' respective standpoints on sovereign and the territorial issues. Third, to focus on a substantive and a technical issue rather than on politics. Uh, while striving for cooperation and goals and sustained progress step by step, hopefully uh, reaping early harvest. Ahead, Last but not the least, to take active attitude in carrying out a constructive dialogue with strategic visions to promoting development cooperation projects and to proactively address the difficulties and challenges faced both independently and collaboratively. One of the GGI slogan is, the impossible missions are the only ones which succeed because we think that only difficult and challengeable things are meaningful. It is in this spirit that Anna and I initiated this dialogue to get together a group of senior scholars to share their perspective on this very important topic. It is expected that the discussion of those above questions could lead to some policy recommendations for both sides. Without further delay, uh, please, Allow me to first invite on Chinese side the professor, but Professor Dr. Zhi Guo Gong, uh, to share his views. Uh, professor Gao is the uh, president of Chinese Society of the Law of the Sea, a former judge of uh, ATOS, professor of Chinese University of Political Science and Law, and also as well a uh, professor of Dalian Maritime University. Uh, just go the floor yours. We expect each speaker to uh, make their remarks uh, within a maximum a maximum of 50 minutes. Thank you, please, the floor is yours. Hello, Professor Gong. Probably we can move to um, Dr. Henry before Professor Gao, because I think he's, he is not in front of his computer. Yeah, please. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, Dr. Henry, let me introduce um, Dr. Henry first before I call him. Dr. Henry Chan. Chan is the Senior Visiting Research Fellow of Cambodia Institute for Cooperation and Peace. He completed his university degree in engineering from the University of the Philippines and also MSc in biopharmaceutical from the University of New South Wales and PhD in Management from Singapore Management University. Dr. Chan's research interest is Chinese economic development, ASEAN and China relations, technology and economic development. Dr. Henry, please proceed. Ah, thank you very much, uh, Captain Tian and uh, Anna for having me here in this uh, very important webinar. I have not prepared my PowerPoint. And uh, my contribution is I want to look at this issue, uh, both the territorial dispute and the issue of oil and gas corporations from a historic and economic development point of view. This is a little bit unusual, but I hope that it can add value to this webinar. First, from the historical perspective, 
let us realize that territorial dispute is older than the notion of statehood. Even before human civilizations, we already have people fighting over territories. So it's right to say that territorial dispute is actually longer than human civilizations. But after we realize this, we have to ask the next question. How come until today, we don't have very satisfactory solutions on these centuries of problems? Now, historically, territorial dispute were settled by peaceful means or non-peaceful means. But I think everybody realized very unfortunately the non-peaceful means actually dominate human history in solving territorial problems. So this is something that we have to take in mind. If we don't take this thing carefully, this thing spillover effect can be very serious. Now, among cases settled by peaceful means, third party arbitration is a very rare occurrence and it only covers very minor disputes. Most peaceful settlement actually involves bilateral negotiations. In this regard, you'd be surprised to know that China has been the most active in recent history in settling peaceful the settlement disputes. China has the longest land border in the world. It runs more than 22,000 kilometers. And it has successfully settled more than 18,000 with 11 neighboring countries by negotiations. Only three countries China has not settled a border alienations, India, Pakistan, and Nepal. Now, why we bring this point up is that if you look at historical lessons, that bilateral negotiation is the dominant mode of the territorial settlement. Now, it reflects just simple that any territorial dispute is an emotional issue. It's already not an issue of legal right or wrong. It's already that people are attached to the place that they think belong to them. And of course, the other thing is that it's very hard. And right now, there's no satisfactory settlement rules. Now, only by bilateral negotiations, both sides can be happy. In fact, most of the countries refuse third party intervention. If you look at human history, talking about territorial settlement. Now, third party arbitration is always very difficult. If you look at these angles from the history of territorial dispute settlement, actually this issue belongs to the realm of geopolitics and diplomacy more than it depends on any legal framework that you can think of. I'm talking about history and these are all facts that everybody realized. And right now, if we talk about why no third party settlement rules is satisfactory, you must understand that the present international law overlooks the fact that you have issues of heritage, you have issue of cultures, and you have issue of emotions inside any territorial discussions. Now, right now, when people talk about that, there's no such an historical claim. They just forget if you look at the case of Israel, this is the best case in the world human history that the historical claims does matter and does counts. And of course, it's very important that why historical is being belittled. Because if you look at the colonial history, like in the case of the Philippines, when the Spaniards came, they just declared the whole country under the king's rule. And that is where the Hacienda history started. All the native barangays communal land were declared none and void. <laughs> so the issue that the historical claim is not a valid issue, carry a lot of judgment calls. Now, of course, you talk about peaceful means, we already settled that uh, based on human history. Bilateral negotiation is the mode. And if you are not very careful, it can easily spill into non-peaceful means. Now, if you look at the non-peaceful means of territorial claim, you realize that it is actually always the result of a war. And then after the war, there's always a peace talk. And the subsequent peace treaty just legalize whatever the victor's claim is. Now, if you remember the statement, whether attributed to Winston Churchill or wrong, that history is written by the vector is a very, very sad, but a very, very historical true statement. 
Now, after this, let us look at the modern warfare. If you look at what happened today in Russia and Ukraine, and I think today is getting to 150 days. Now, there are now six forces operating in this new era of fighting. You have the traditional land war, sea war, air war, and then you have these uh, nuclear strategic warfares. And right now you can already see that we have cyber warfares and space warfares. So the war today is getting very, very complicated. And after looking at this, you realize that how many countries can afford to fight this kind of war? And everybody knows that the two top campaigners is the United States of America and the People's Republic of China. Now, if you look at the widening gap between the military powers and the other countries because of this industrial revolution, which is actually have all the precedents in the early industrial revolutions, they, in each industrial revolution, you have new military power emerging. Now, it's very sad for other countries. If you look at this war, we have the autonomous weapons now being come in, the drones, and you have precision weapons, the HEMAS. And if you look at all this, you realize that the cost of war today, actually for those military powers, is getting lower and lower because human casualty is being cut. But for the other countries, it is getting more destructive. You just look at the footage of any Ukrainian cities. You know what that means. They live in rubles more than any other thing you can imagine. So it is very important that we there's a territorial dispute, which is always happening in human history. We must look for peaceful means of resolving it. The cost of war today is just too much. Now, very luckily, what happened between China and the Philippines is maritime territories. And again, if you look at human history, resolving maritime territorial dispute is a lot easier than the land dispute. And the reason is very simple. Because if you look at the sea dispute, always the center is on resources. Of course, number one thing is always fishing. And right now, of course, with this own clause, you have the mineral rights, and you have this oil and gas. Uh, now, another thing is that in the sea territorial dispute, because it's not really where the people live, the attachment to the sea is much less than the attachment to the land. So many people actually don't consider the sea dispute as a challenge to national patrimony. And that is very important. Uh, now, if you re realize that, uh, I'm sorry I did not prepare the slides, but uh, I share it with Anna is that even though one of the biggest gas fields in the world in the, between Qatar and Iran is cut across the boundary and they have worked out a means to share all the gas recovery. This is one of the biggest gas fields in the world. So if you look at the Mediterranean seas, they have a lot of islands and how they look at the fishing right. So they have very peaceful means of resolving it. So this one actually brings us to the issue of, if you take a look at oil and gas as an economic interest and maritime territory is more about economic interest, this should form a very background to the peaceful resolution of the current issues. So if you look at our webinar topic, oil and gas joint development corporations, I think that if the mechanism can be worked out well and explained properly to the people, there is a chance that you will have public support. So I look at the angles from the historical perspective, because I must admit, I'm never an expert in geopolitics, law of the sea, law of the oceans, but I just look at things of what had happened before in human history, and I hope that that can help. Now, after looking at it from the historic perspective, let us look at it now from the development economics perspective. Because my profession, I'm trained as a development economist. And of course, when you train as a development economist, there's a heavy dose of historical precedents that I can, I study. What really happened to those countries who succeeded in economic development and who are the countries who failed in economic development? And what are the lessons that we can draw? Okay, 
The first question I want to pose to the audience is this. Everybody now talk about the weather. China this year is a very abnormal weather. Many places is over 40, and then you have floods in somewhere. And Europe in the US is scorched earth, okay? So many countries over 40 degrees. Now, the commitment to climate is definitely something we cannot get away. If the climate change is proceed at this rate, human civilization is going to change dramatically. Our survival is at stake. In fact, Southeast Asia is in a very difficult situation. I study this climate change and must tell you that if you go to Navotas today, you know how many places can easily get flooded in the high tide, okay? The ocean is really rising. The water is intruding. Now, this question is this. So many countries now commit to so-called zero carbon emission by 2050, 2060, okay? Now, you know that one of the biggest economic victim of carbon neutralization is oil and gas because they are the one producing the carbon dioxide that warm the planets. So if you realize that, shall we, I pose this question, shall we exploit the oil and gas, oil and gas today when they are very valuable, because right now in Manila, everybody is suffering from this high price of gasoline. But you can already foresee over the long term of 20, 30 years, oil and gas importance to global economy is going to be diminished, whether we like it or not, because we have no choice but to phase them out. So, number one thing, are we going to fight over an asset that the value is diminishing by emotions? Very objectively, from the development economics point of view, let us be realistic. Get them out first of the ground and help the economy as soon as you can. Now, everybody know that military expenditure is a consumption and not an investment in most countries. Only those countries who build arms, like the Nazi Germany, need an arm industry. Most of the others who buy arms realize that Military expenditure is a waste. That is why you have a classical saying economics, a choice between gun and butter. You can only choose one, okay? Now, it is without dispute that all countries need a very peaceful environment to focus on economic development. It is a reality that a benign external environment is a necessary condition for economic development. And I think in the case of China, Nobody talk about it more often than Mr. Deng Xiaoping, who initiated the reform. Now, however, we know that a benign external peaceful environment is a necessary condition for economic takeoff, but this alone is not sufficient for takeoff. If we want economic takeoff, we need corresponding domestic reforms. Whatever the gas and oil and gas bonanza can bring you cannot alone to move the country forward. This is one point we have to explain to the people. We need a necessary international benign environment. We want capital money coming from the oil and gas, but we must also work hard, okay? Now, there's a story I want to suggest both the Filipino and the Chinese audience take a look. If you remember in 1960, South Korean per capita GDP was only 60% of the Philippines, 1960. But today, South Korea per capita GDP is 10 times the Philippines. So in the economic takeoff of South Korea, we have a term, a story called the miracle of the Han River. Now Han River is the river that across, cut across Seoul. If you look at the miracle of Han River, the normalization of Japan-Korea relationship is a very, play a very important role. So there was a treaty that President Park Chung-hee signed in 1965 with Japan called the 1965 Korea-Japan Normalization Treaty. That one play a very important role. And if these oil and gas explorations can bring similar benefit to the Philippines, I think all Filipino peoples will love to have it. Okay, now there's so many details in this, but again, the miracle of Han River is available in Wikipedia and everywhere. Please look at it. 
and see how the whole process runs. Now, I must say this way, the treaty remains a little bit controversial today because all those comfort women, all those uh, forced labor issues in the Japanese colonial history in South Korea were absorbed under this treaty, but this treaty did bring tangible effect, benefits to the South Koreans. Now, and again, this miracle of Han River, personally, I believe, is a very good example of how a good external relationship helps jumpstart a country. Uh, this is very important. We have to learn from history, how others did it, how are we going to replicate it and modify to suit our conditions. Now, President Marcos is very right to point out that the relationship between China and the Philippines is a multi-dimensional one, and we should focus on the positive sides. However, I must caution you, the framing of the 1987 constitutions, ignoring the difference between territorial water and exclusive economic zone, will always make the president's legal position not as strong as you like. Now, in these constitutions, you must remember under UNCLOS, every country has 12 nautical miles of territorial waters. But the 200 nautical mile refer to exclusive economic zone. So that means from the 188, from the, two, from the 13 to 100 to the 200, the country does not exercise exclusive sovereignty. It just has control over economic interests. But unfortunately, in 1987, legal experts do not look at this issue very closely. So I have seen that in the initial negotiations, everybody talked about sovereignty. So it's, I'm sorry to point this thing out, and it's very unfortunate. So it is very important for the whole issue be, being discussed openly with all the legal argument and economic argument being put forward very carefully. And I'm sure that uh, the citizenry we support an enlightened government to have this idea pushed forward. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. Um, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Henry is also the adjunct research fellow at the Integrated Development Studies Institute. So if you if you listen to Dr. Henry, he, he is trying to lay ground the historical, um, somewhat historical perspective to the issue of um, territorial dispute and in relation to the um, oil and uh, oil and gas joint development cooperation between the Philippines and China. Um, vis a vis the uh, disputed South China Sea, because that's where it's supposed to be located. So, what he's just saying is, you know, that, you know, there's a need for this oil and gas development to proceed, but at the same time, there are a lot of things to work on between the two countries. And another thing that I think is very important that I want to point out with um, Dr. Henry's um, talk is that bilateral negotiation is the way to settle territorial disputes. So, without further ado, I will give the floor back to Captain Andy for the introduction of. Um, again, of our next speaker, or previous speaker, supposedly. <laughs> Captain Andy? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna. A very impressive, uh, Dr. Henry. I, I think that if we grasp the opportunity, the time between China and the Philippines could become a golden period. If we lost the opportunity to develop ourselves, it would be unfortunate. Thank you. Uh, I have introduced uh, Judge Gao as I uh, reintroduce him again. Please, uh, uh, I mean, my assistant, would you please uh, help to uh, share uh, the PPT on the, um, on the screen? Uh, uh, Professor Dr. Zhu Guogao uh, is uh, the president of Chinese Society of the Law of the Sea, uh, former judge of April, professor of Chinese University of Political Science and Law, and as well, uh, professor of Dalian Maritime University. Uh, judge Gao, Yes. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, would you okay, please? Okay, thank uh, you. Thank you, Captain Tian. Uh, let me try to share my PowerPoint. Uh, 
uh, video. Uh, let's see. Can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Okay. Uh, dear Anna and Andy, we have two ends here and distinguished panelists, distinguished attendees online from both China, the Philippines, and perhaps a third place elsewhere. Good afternoon. Uh, first, I'd like to commend the two organizing uh, institution, institutions from both China and the Philippines to organize this uh, webinar on oil and gas joint development cooperation between China and the Philippines. We all understand that the Sino-Filipino relations arrive at a new junction in the sense that there is a new administration in the Philippines. And of course, worldwide, uh, we have a general world backdrop, and that is the uh, conflict in Europe between uh, Russia and Ukraine. Uh, so this uh, dialogue is really, in my view, is really timely, very necessary and very important and to, for, for, for both of us to move forward. I feel very honored to be included in the program of this webinar. And I also feel excited to once again touch upon with other panelists on one of my favorite topics in, in my professional career. I will uh, move forward in four brief phases and I'll speak roughly for 20 minutes. Uh, uh, about 30 years ago, I was teaching in a British university. The reason for me to move on from US to teach in the UK is that my PhD supervisor, Weiser told me, and he said, I quote, if you have taught in a British university, you can teach anywhere in the world, unquote. So this is why I went. Uh, during my teaching time, I published my first book in English, I entitled International Petroleum Conference. This is why I say one of my favorite topic. The book has been published for, for the last 30 years and it still sells at a very strong price, 450 US dollars a copy. Uh, the other thing I wish, wish to mention or share with the panelists is that roughly 25 years ago, I published an article entitled The Legal Concept and Aspects of Joint Development in International Law. Uh, I have an electronic copy with me and uh, if any one of you wish to have a copy and you can email me or WeChat me, I will be able to circulate uh, this to you. Let me, let me, let me go back. Bear with me. Uh, yeah. uh, another thing I wish to mention to the Filipino colleagues is that uh, we both countries started our negotiation or, or consultation on joint development roughly 20 years ago. I have a, a set of PowerPoint uh, dates back to 2002, March 5th and 6th. Uh, this initial official dialogue 
we could also call negotiation between China and Philippines, uh, was organized by the two foreign ministries. And the Chinese team is assisted, was assisted by a group of experts headed by me. And this is the PowerPoint I presented at the initial, if not the first dialogue or negotiations between our two countries. And finally, as an attraction point, I want to touch upon the 2018 oil and gas memorandum between China and the Philippines. And that was signed on 22nd November 2018, when His Excellency, the President of China, paid a state visit to the Philippines. And the MOU also uh, authorized to establish a joint steering committee. And uh, over the last couple of years, in particular in 2019 and 20, the joint steering committee and the oil industry representatives from the two oil companies from both sides worked intensively to negotiate and produce a series of contractual terms and conditions. Yeah. Uh, so those are some of the background information. And then I move on quickly to my second phase. That is, I want, we wish to say a few words on international law. The concept of joint development is a new, relatively recent notion and began in the 1960s. And the trends towards acceptance or in-state practice accelerated since 1970s. Uh, there, there is no official or consensus on the uh, definition of joint development. I uh, attempted to arrive at an academic definition in my article when I stated joint development as the common exercise of sovereign rights and jurisdiction. Now, common exercise, sovereign rights and jurisdiction. It's not an unilateral exercise based on the international agreement for the purpose of exploitation and apportionment of a potential natural resources in an overlapping area of territorial disputes, pending delimitation. Uh, this personal definition uh, embraces or embodies five key elements. The first one is there must be a dispute. Of course, there must be natural resources, non-living resources. There are need and governmental intergovernmental agreement for the purpose of joint operation. It is finally uh, a transitional in character. It's not a permanent, it's not a final resolution. Although the notion is of relatively origin, um, but the concept or the principle uh, deeply rooted in both conventional international law, customary international law, international adjudication, state practices, and principles, soft law, or principles, general principles of law. Uh, let's uh, have a look at the conventional international law. We refer to Article 7483 of the Laws Convention. It reads, binding agreement as provided in paragraph one, the states concerned in a spirit of understanding and cooperation shall make every effort to enter provisional arrangements of a practical nature. And during this transitional period, not to jeopardize or hamper the region of the final agreement. Such arrangements shall be without prejudice 
to the final delimitation. So this is the conventional international law. Uh, let's move on. In the interest of time, let's move on. Uh, one of the, uh, I'd like perhaps uh, to mention two features of this uh, treaty uh, provision or articulation. The first major point is non-prejudice. It's non-prejudice to the pre-arrangement position or final delimitation. This is very, very important. And also in my view, the uh, Article 74 and 83 general, in general, or more specifically, <coughs> concept or principle joint development, or to say uh, temporary arrangement, is in nature both incentive and prohibitive. prohibitive. It is prohibitive in the sense that it prohibits any unilateral action or movement to the damage or to the prejudice of the other, the interest of the other side. It is incentive in the sense it encourages both parties to negotiate in a spirit of understanding and cooperation for any form of temporary arrangement of a practical nature. Uh, let's move very quickly to state practice. And let's look some of the, uh, I have a table here. We're running from the very first one in 1965 between Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. Uh, it's a joint development agreement in the neutral zone in the Persian Gulf. And then winding down to the list at the end of the list, and we have two Asian examples. Number seven, the Thailand and Malaysia Memorandum on Joint Development in the Gulf of Thailand. And the 1990 and the Timor Gap Treaty between Indonesia and Australia in the Timor Sea. Uh, we will not go into any details of the uh, of these state practices since I think uh, we know most of them. But we move very quickly and to see some of the Chinese practices and China and Japan side and fishery agreement in the East China Sea uh, in terms of a joint cooperation development of non-living resources fishery. Uh, another agreement is South Korea and China in the Yellow Sea and also is a fishery agreement. Uh, a third one is the uh, Sino-Vietnam Maritime Boundary and Fishery Agreement in the Gulf of Tonkin. Finally, we have the Sino-Philippines MOU and Joint Development Negotiations uh, since 2018. As I said, the steering committee held an, a number of, number of rounds of talks and the industry representatives from the oil companies from both countries uh, went on intensively uh, to deal with some of the concrete contractual terms and conditions. Uh, I think the negotiation between China and Philippines uh, in the current round is much uh, uh, broader and in-depth than the previous uh, agreements uh, since it touches upon very concrete and detailed aspects of oil and gas development. Uh, now I have about five minutes to go. Uh, let's quickly jump to some uh, my final part of the uh, presentation, some findings and conclusions. 
drone uh, development has been on the rise over the last 40 years. It covers both living, non-living resources, as well as perhaps other forms of uh, uh, natural endowment. Uh, one of the things I like to stress is Southeast Asia. South Asia produces some of the finest models in terms of uh, joint development. Uh, the first one is between Malaysia and Thailand. And the second one perhaps we can we could mention is that between Indonesia and Australia. Yeah. Uh, it proves that joint development is a workable approach to complicated territorial disputes and sovereign issues. Uh, in my understanding, uh, the very secret for the success of joint development depends very much on the genuine political will, wills, plural forms here. It's not the will of one party, it needs the wills of both parties. Uh, the 2018 MOU between the two sides is a legal document of a treaty nature. If you read, it's, it's an official, it's a intergovernmental MOU. It's a, it's an international legal instrument. It's not a political uh, sort of a declination. Yeah. And the work of the Joint Steering Committee and the contractual negotiations by the oil companies demonstrate the spirit as provided as provided in the convention, the spirit of understanding and cooperation of our two governments. Yeah. Uh, as I recalled to you in my uh, opening uh, PowerPoint, uh, the uh, the talk, the initial talk between our two countries started, to my best knowledge, in 2002. 20 years has flied over. So it, take, it takes us 20 years to arrive at the present stage of oil and gas joint development cooperation. It's not an easy task, dear colleagues, dear friends. 20 years, almost a time of a generation. Yeah, it's painful. Uh, both China and Philippines are parties to the United Nations Convention on the law of the sea. And oil and gas cooperation development, or in other words, temporary arrangement of a particular nature is a treaty obligation for both China and the Philippines on Articles 84 and 73 of the Convention. So we have, uh, perhaps we have uh, two set of uh, rights and obligations here. And one, one set is the uh, treaty rights and obligations under the Laws Convention for both countries. Uh, the other set of rights and obligations is under the MOU. It's the intergovernmental MOU signed in 2018. Uh, I wish to issue one warning as well as one call uh, for my conclusion. The warning is that it is unrealistic, if not naive, both politically and legally, for either side to expect a rollback by the other side from its sovereign and territorial positions or policies or constitutional provisions, neither China no, the Philippines, yeah. It's not realistic. 
to expect is expect the other side to give up completely. Oh, uh, my second point is that it would constitute a major mistake. It's not a pity. Uh, it's a major mistake for both sides to retreat from the 2018 MOU and the subsequent negotiations of what we have achieved with mutual painful efforts in a period of over 20 years. Now it's a, we made one step forward in 20 years with the mutual painful efforts. It takes a little time or zero time for us to roll back. Yeah. And we, we can roll back today or even tomorrow. Yeah. And that, that is the that is a that is really a, a pity, uh, a major mistake. Yeah. Uh, finally, my call is still pending any agreement or a final resolution. Temporary arrangement in the spirit of understanding and cooperation represents in the South China Sea. And with that, I conclude my presentation and thank you for your time very much. Thank you, Judge Gao. Uh, Judge Gao help us uh, recall the history of the bilateral talk, bilateral talk and also uh, with his uh, deep academic ground to uh, help us understand the legal foundations of the joint developments. Thank you very much. And also, uh, at your conclusion, the, 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 the warning and the points uh, you mentioned, thank you very much. And without further delay, uh, Anna, I will uh, turn it over back the floor to you. Um. Um, Captain Andy, I think it's you who will introduce the third um, speaker. But before you introduce the third speaker, I think one of my takeaways um, from the presentation of Professor Gao is that, that stick, and I, I think very, very important point that we all need to understand, I think, especially our leaders in, in of both countries, is that the success of oil and joint development cooperation or any cooperation for that matter between the two countries, especially on the disputed South China Sea, is I think that both governments will have strong political will um, to, to, to pursue uh, in, 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 in the context of mutual understanding and benefit for both countries and their peoples. I think that's one thing that I, I that absorbed and I, I, I got uh, strongly from the presentation as well of, of Professor Gao, this, um, along with the many other um, knowledge and, and, and information that um, I, I, I received and I got from, from his presentation. Um, Captain Andy, please introduce the third speaker. Thank you. Agree. Uh, quite agree with you on your comments. And now, uh, please allow me to introduce our third speaker, uh, Mr. Uh, Yang Li, Li Yang. Uh, he's the uh, executive director uh, from the Institute of China European Studies, ICES. Uh, Mr. Yang Li, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, uh, thanks, Captain Andy, and thank the uh, co-hosts for organizing this uh, very important event. And good morning and hello to everyone from, uh, from Brussels, because uh, ISIS, uh, the Institute for China-Europe Studies, is a Brussels-based think tank, so with a focus on China-Europe's uh, relations. Uh, so one, I'm here talking about oil and gas uh, cooperation between China and the Philippines. I do it more in my personal capacity, uh, using the experience uh, from my past service uh, with China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, as well as uh, with my research uh, in the uh, National Institute for the South China Sea Studies. And uh, uh, with regard to the uh, general situation of China-Philippine relations, uh, as pointed out uh, by many commentators, uh, President uh, Marcos uh, is expected to continue with a balanced and a programmatic approach uh, in Philippines foreign policy. And we could see that uh, China and the Philippines 
have already agreed uh, to develop a better and more robust uh, relationship. And they also agreed that in this uh, very important bilateral relationship, the South China Sea issue shall not be the mainstream. So it is very uh, promising, but however, this does not imply that the South China Sea issue is no longer important. On the contrary, it does indicate that both countries, both sides have to address this issue more carefully and in a more responsible manner. And oil and gas uh, joint development is one of the issues that still need to remain on the agenda. So which comes to our topic today. I would like to make my comments uh, from three perspectives by looking down, looking back, and looking ahead. And my first point is from looking down to the bottom or to the root of this issue. The reason why the subject of oil and gas joint development comes up is that China and the Philippines have disputes in the South China Sea. And those disputes are territorial in nature and in origin. Only later extended to maritime rights and jurisdiction as the 1982 United Convention on the Law of the Sea entered into force in mid 1990s. Oil and gas or fisheries, this kind of contests over resources often appear on the headlines, but they are only symptoms, not the root cause. The root cause is territorial disputes. And such kind of disputes exists in many parts of the world. South China Sea is not a unique case. On the other hand, we can find that nowadays, when people talk about South China Sea, they often approach this issue from the perspective of uh, geopolitics or economic development. And this is fine. But when doing so, they shall not ignore that the territorial disputes are at the root of the case. And these disputes have a profound influence over all the current troubles in the South China Sea. And because the territorial sovereignty is at stake, neither China nor Philippines has any room for compromise. Uh, some statesmen uh, from the Philippines said that this country had no intention to surrender even a particle of sovereignty. And in fact, the same attitude applies to Chinese government. So the issue of territorial sovereignty is too sensitive and too difficult to be resolved within the foreseeable future. Maritime boundary delimitation might be a different story and supposed to be easier. However, with territorial disputes pending, there is always a lack of conditions for the delimitations to be concluded in a short while. Under such circumstances, the logic, the only logic applied in these disputes, as it is applied to disputes in other parts of the world, is that transitional or provisional measures are always the best option to address the issue. Uh, for example, as far as the maritime boundary delimitation is concerned, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea also provides for such arrangements. And Judge Gao uh, just now has read the text of the provisions in detail, so I will not repeat it. And Judge Gao is also right to stress that such transitional or provisional measures are not final solutions. They only create certain conditions or environment which are conducive to the final settlement, or at least they create a sense of direction, a sense of predictability and confidence that both countries could proceed on the right track with their bilateral relations. And that relationship would not be derailed by such disputes. Of course, agreeing on these measures might not be an easy task. It will take time, but it deserves working upon. So this is my first point. And my second point is from looking back over history. China and the Philippines disputes in the South China Sea started in early 1970s. At that stage, we can find that the disputes did not compose a major trouble for the relations, since both sides had more uh, important 
an urgent agenda to attend to. In mid 1990s, temporary tensions erupted around the mischief reef. However, a series of bilateral dialogues helped cool down the situation. And later, a declaration of conduct of parties, a DOC, was signed in 2004, uh, 2002, and which gave a fresh impetus for the claimants to seek amicable solutions to the disputes between and among themselves and pursue practical cooperation at the sea. It was under this background that China and the Philippines, the national oil companies of the countries, with the endorsement of their respective governments, successfully entered into an arrangement in 2004 for joint marine seismic undertakings, JMSU, a technical term that really refers to oil and gas exploration. And in 2005, the cooperation was extended to include National Oil Company of Vietnam, making it a tripartite joint effort. The JMSU agreement expired in 2008, three years later. It did not enter into the next phase of joint, explo uh, joint exploitation in the defined area as anticipated. The main and the direct course was the domestic politics of the Philippines. So I'll not expand on this point since everyone here is supposed to have certain knowledge about it. And some scholars also raised the opinion that the United States also might have some role to play in the outcome of this cooperation. Anyway, the JMSU has now become a part of history with quite different, even opposing narratives surrounding the story. And the negative comments consider the cooperation as a failed episode. Some even describes it, uh, or, or the result of the cooperation as disastrous. My opinion is that it is true that the JMSU did not achieve what had been anticipated from the very beginning. However, it is not fair to describe it as a failure. Essentially, it could be seen as initial progress happened in a long and possibly painstaking process. And it did leave positive marks in such a process. Number one, it demonstrates that something could be done technically and commercially. Number two, although uh, JMSU has got a negative image in the domestic environment of the Philippines, the deal does not lose its value and validity in international relations. It still constitutes a worthwhile experiment for both countries and the South China Sea region at large. Number three, it could be seen that during 2005 to 2008, when the JMSU was in force, no major incidents happened in the South China Sea, at least between China and the Philippines. Situation in the South China Sea got a downward spiral only after 2008. So I will not list all the incidents from then until 2016. And they're quite familiar to the people in this meeting. And, and China and the Philippines, now after 2016, the situation came back to a relatively calm state. This time, again, partly due to the domestic change of the Philippines. And the two countries resumed bilateral dialogues and successfully managed the sporadic incidents happened at the sea, preventing them from escalating into major confrontation or conflicts. And the two countries, as mentioned by the previous speakers, also signed the Memorandum of Understanding and Cooperation on Oil and Gas Development in Manila in November 2018, which is one of the most remarkable legacies left by the interactions between China and the Philippines during the Duterte administration. So you could see that 10 years later, from 2008 to 2018, China and the Philippines had to come back to what had been started. Even with a minor step forward, this time by signing the intergovernmental MOU and establishing official mechanisms to oversee its implementation. So the lesson is that seeking oil and gas joint development is a long process with twists and turns. But as long as the two sides took one step backwards and then two steps forward, 
things are going in a positive direction. The two countries could not afford to step in backwards all the time, for by such a scenario, they would move toward an unpredictable, unintended, and possibly irreversible direction. So as one of the uh, backgrounds of our discussion today, uh, we noticed that as mentioned by uh, Captain Andy earlier, uh, 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 former Foreign Secretary Lotte's remarks last month maybe you know, cast some uncertainties over the prospect of the MOU. However, we could see some opposing trends also inside the Philippines. You know, Senator uh, Robin Hood Padilla only two days ago filed a resolution urging President Marcos to resume bilateral talks for oil and gas cooperation with China in the South China Sea. So we can see that the dust has not been settled yet. So that brings me to my third point, looking ahead or looking into the future. The process of seeking oil and gas joint development is expected to go on, even possibly not by a straight line, but it has to go on. And it is reasonable to forecast that China-Philippine relationship during the term of Marcos will remain stable and even take the upward trend and which provides a favorable element for the cooperation. However, there are many obstacles as well. Compared with in 2008 and even with 2016, the overall strategic environment has gone increasingly hostile with the US-China strategic rivalry becoming maybe a fact of life, particularly in this region. And the South China Sea is a major arena for this rivalry. And also the domestic politics, the perceived constitutional constraints within the Philippines and the public opinions from both sides still have their negative influence. Again, there are still very opposing legal positions and legal opinions between the two countries, which would only intensify the objections from the domestic audience or even from third parties in the world. So that how to proceed. My biggest suggestion is never ever give up the MOU. So reading the delicately phrased text of the MOU, you can find that this document actually reflects or represents the greatest common denominator on oil and gas cooperation that can be identified or achieved by the two sides so far. And this gives the MOU its substantial and everlasting value, even more so than it being an intergovernmental instrument simply. The MOU, by consolidating this set of greatest common denominator and providing a stable and a predictable sense of direction, may all the time serve as an anchor for the China-Philippine relationship and their interactions on the South China Sea whether under Duterte or Marcos or any other Philippine administrations, as long as the South China Sea disputes exist. So sticking to MOU is not a matter of inheritance, but a matter of adherence, Ad adherence to a process which could only go ahead, although there might be ups and downs. So it is suggested that China and the Philippines could make some recommitment to the MOU at a high political level to sustain the momentum, to sustain the political will as mentioned earlier by Anna, to demonstrate, sustain that political will, even in recognition that the final outcome might still take time. But the momentum, the direction is very important. And another suggestion of mine is change mindset and keep working. What are those mindsets that need to be changed? For example, maybe we should recognize that oil and gas joint development is only a transitional arrangement, not the end game. Take it as a common problem confronting both sides rather than a life and death race between the two countries and solve the problem together collectively. Another example for the mindset changing is that Rest assured that claims and the legal positions of both sides will not be affected by this transition arrangement before any final solutions come about. 
There is abundant international practice from which the two countries could learn lessons, as Judge Gao pointed out earlier. And let diplomats and lawyers to figure out how to formulate the text in order to be double sure. And also professional experts could also make their contribution and inputs. So long as this arrangement is acceptable to both sides, with the disclaimer clause mentioned above, well in, uh, uh, well in place, the arrangement would be consistent with international law, including the provisions of UNCLOS mentioned earlier. And another you know, mindset that is necessary is that we could use the favorable momentum created by the collective efforts of China and ASEAN member states in negotiating a code of conduct in the South, South China Sea region and try the best to alienate the South China Sea disputes from the current geopolitical strife. And I, I think this is very important. At the least, oil and gas joint development between China and the Philippines does not constitute a game changer for the strategic landscape. So make it a commercial, technical, a political transitional arrangement, not something that will change the strategic environment. Actually, even the United States itself said it would compete against China. At the same time, we also cooperate with China when necessary. So at any rate, I think gas and oil in the South China Sea is a case which is necessary for China and the Philippines to cooperate. So with that, uh, I will conclude my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Yang Li. I like your style of presentation in a retrospective and a prospective uh, logic. And uh, also, uh, you mentioned one interesting point that is often neglected by ordinary people. That is, we should not mistake uh, sovereign rights with sovereignty. And also, given your own experience as a, a diplomat, diplomat and your involvement in the previous discussions, I, I would like to echo the cred credibility uh, you, you gave to the previous uh, talks and accomplishments, and also very important and very impressive that all your um, concrete suggestions we have taken down. And I hope that those kind of messages could pass on to policymakers as a kind of a policy recommendation. Thank you very much. Uh, and I would like to uh, uh, turn over the floor to you and I welcome you to make some comments. Anna, please. Yes, um, thank you, Captain Andy, and thank you so much um, for that presentation. Um, I think my, uh, uh, my takeaway is that never, never give up. <laughs> we should never give up um, in trying you know, to, to make something out of the oil and gas joint development cooperation between the two countries, China and the Philippines. And I think the process may be um, tedious. Probably there's so many ups and downs. But at the end of the day, I think every step of the way is a success success that we can consider and i hope both countries will realize this no that you know we are distinct because geographically we're really neighbors so we that the best thing forward is as much as possible is to join um to be together and um establish joint cooperation in every possible way especially when you talk about maritime resources um to introduce our second our our fourth speaker um before that let me um encourage our viewers and participants of this webinar to please feel free to um write your question in the chat box later we will try to accommodate them and let our um excellent panel of speakers to respond to your question so now to introduce our fourth speaker <music>